Book One, Chapter Two, Part Two of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One by Henry Charles Lee. Book One, Chapter Two: The Jews and the Moors, Part Two. The Saracens long maintained the policy adopted in the conquest, and made no attempt to convert their Christian subjects, just as in the Levantine provinces the Christians, though oppressed, were allowed to retain their religion, and in Persia, after the fall of the Sassanids, Parsism continued to exist for centuries and only died out gradually. In fact, the condition of the Mozarabes, or subject Christians, under the caliphs of Cordova was, for the most part, preferable to what it had been under the Gothic kings. Mosarabes were frequently in command of the Moslem armies. They formed the royal bodyguard, and were employed as secretaries in the highest offices of state. In time they so completely lost the Latin tongue, that it became necessary to translate the scripture and the canons into Arabic. The church organization was maintained, with its hierarchy of prelates, who at times assembled in councils. There was sufficient intellectual activity for occasional heresies to spring up and be condemned, like those of Ostahasis and Mihetio in the ninth century, while half a century earlier the bull of Adrian I, addressed to the Orthodox bishops of Spain and denouncing the Adoptianism of Felix of Urgel, which was upheld by Elipandus, Archbishop of Toledo, shows the freedom of intercourse existing between the Mozarabes and the rest of Christendom. We hear of San Ulogio of Cordova, whose two brothers, Alvar and Isidore, had left Spain and taken service with the Emperor Louis le Germanique. He set out in 850 to join them, but was stopped at Pampeluna by war and returned by way of Saragossa, bringing with him a number of books, including Virgil, Horace, Juvenal, Porphyry, the epigrams of Aldenhelm, and the fables of Avienus. Mixed marriages seem not to have been uncommon, and there were frequent instances of conversion from either faith, but Mozarabic zealots abused the Moslem tolerance by publicly decrying Islam and making proselytes, which was forbidden, and a sharp persecution arose under Abderrahman II and Mahomet I, in which there were a number of victims, including Sanulohio, who was martyred in 859. This persecution gave rise to an incident which illustrates the friendly intercourse between Christian and Saracen. In 858, Hilduin, abbot of St. Germain de Pre, under the auspices of Charles Le Chauve, sent two monks to Spain to procure the relics of St. Vincent. On reaching Languedoc, they learned that his body had been carried to Benevento, but they also heard of the persecution at Cordova and were delighted knowing that there must be plenty of relics to be obtained. They therefore kept on to Barcelona, where Sunifred, the next in command to the count, commended them to Abdulavar, prince of Saragossa, with whom he had intimate relations. From Saragossa they reached Cordova, where the Mozarabic bishop Saul received them kindly and assisted them in obtaining the bodies of St. George and St. Aurelius, except that, as the head of the latter was lacking, that of St. Natalia was substituted. With these precious spoils, they returned in safety to Paris by way of Toledo, Acala, Saragossa, and Barcelona, to the immense gratification, we are told, of King Charles. The persecution was but temporary, and a century later, in 956, we hear of Abderrahman III sending Resamund, Bishop of Elvira, Granada, as his ambassador to Otho the Great at Frankfurt, where he persuaded Lutprand of Cremona to write one of his historical works. When the Cid conquered Valencia in 1096, one of the conditions of surrender was that the garrison should be composed of Mozarabes, and the capitulation was signed by the principal Christian as well as Moslem citizens. The number of Mozarabes, of course, diminished rapidly in the progress of reconquest as the Christian territories expanded from Galicia to Leon and Castile. Early in the twelfth century, Alfonso the Sixth, in reducing to order his extensive acquisitions, experienced much trouble with them. 
they are described as being worse than moors and he settled the matter by the decisive expedient of deporting multitudes of them to africa the rapid progress of his arms however had so alarmed the petty kings among whom andalusia was divided that they had about ten ninety invited to their assistance the berbers known as amoravides who drove back alfonso on the bloody field of salaca their leader husuf ibn tetufin was not content to fight for the benefit of his allies he speedily overthrew their feeble dynasties and established himself as supreme in moslem spain the almoravides were savage and fanatical they could not endure the sight of christians enjoying freedom of worship and bitter persecution speedily followed until in eleven twenty five the mozarabes invited the aid of alfonso el batallador they sent a roll of their best warriors comprising twelve thousand names and promised that these and many more would join him he came and spent fifteen months on moorish territory but made no permanent conquests and on his departure the wretched christians begged him to let them accompany him to escape the wrath of the almoravides ten thousand of them did so while of those who remained large numbers were deported to africa where they mostly perished the miserable remnant had a breathing spell for the atmosphere of spain seemed unpropitious to fanaticism and the ferocity of the berbers speedily softened we soon find them fraternizing with christians king ali of cordova treated the latter well and even entrusted to a captive noble of barcelona named reverter the command of his armies his son tetufin followed his example and was regarded as the especial friend of the christians who aided him in his african wars yet this interval of rest was short in eleven forty six another berber horde known as almohades overthrew the almoravides and brought a fresh accession of savage ferocity from the african deserts their caliph abd al mumin proclaimed that he would suffer none but true believers in his dominions the alternatives offered were death conversion or expatriation many underwent pretended conversion others went into voluntary exile and others were deported to africa after which the mozarabes disappear from view yet it was as impossible for the almohades to retain their fanaticism as it had proved for their predecessors when in twelve twenty eight on the deposition of the almohad miramamelin al abdel his nephew yahia was raised to the throne his brother al memon albo el ola who was in spain claimed the succession to obtain the assistance of san fernando the third who lent him twelve thousand christian troops he agreed to surrender ten frontier strongholds to permit the erection of a christian church in morocco where the christians should celebrate publicly with ringing of bells and to allow freedom of conversion from islam to christianity with prohibition of the converse this led to the foundation of an episcopate of morocco of which the first bishop was fray aguelo succeeded by fray lope both franciscans cooperation of this kind with the christians meets us at every step in the annals of the spanish saracens abdin el amar who founded the last dynasty of granada agreed to become a vassal of san fernando the third to pay him a tribute of one hundred fifty thousand doblas per annum to furnish a certain number of troops whenever called upon and to appear in the cortes when summoned like any other rico home he aided fernando greatly in the capture of seville and in the solemnities which followed the entry into the city fernando bestowed knighthood on him and granted him the bearing of the castilian guidon gulus a band or with two serpents and two crowned lions as supporters a cognizance still to be seen in the alhambra the muladies or christian converts to islam formed another important portion of the moorish community at the conquest as we have seen large numbers of christians apostatized slaves to obtain freedom and freemen to escape taxation they were looked upon however with suspicion by arabs and berbers and were subjected to disabilities which led to frequent rebellions and murderous reprisals on the suppression of a rising in cordova in eight fourteen fifteen thousand of them emigrated to egypt where they captured alexandria and held it until eight twenty six when they were forced to capitulate 
and transferred their arms to Candia, founding a dynasty which lasted for a century and a half. Eight thousand of them established themselves in Fez, where they held their own and even in the fourteenth century were distinguishable from the other Moslems. In Toledo, after several unsuccessful rebellions, the Muladies became dominant in 853 and remained independent for eighty years. Together with the Mozarabes, they almost succeeded in founding a kingdom of their own in the mountains of Ronda, under Omar ben Hafsun, who embraced Christianity. Indeed, the facility of conversion from one faith to another was a marked feature of the period, and shows how little firmness of religious conviction existed. The renegade Ibn Meruan, who founded an independent state in Merida, taught a mixed faith compounded of both the great religions. Everywhere the Muladies were striving for freedom and establishing petty principalities, in Algarve, in Priego, in Murcia, and especially in Aragon, where the Gothic family of the Beni Kasi became supreme. After the reduction of Toledo by starvation, in 930, they became less prominent and gradually merged into the Moslem population. This was assisted by the fact that they made common cause with their conquerors against the fanatic Almoravides and Almohades. The leader of the Andalusians against the latter was a man of Christian descent, Ibn Mardanich, king of Valencia and Murcia. He wore Christian dress and arms, his language was Castilian, and his troops were mostly Castilians, Navarres, and Catalans. To the Christians he was commonly known as the King Don Lope. Religious differences, in fact, were of much less importance than political aims, and everywhere, as we shall see, Christian and Moslem were intermingled in the interminable civil broils of that tumultuous time. In an attempt on Granada in 1162, the principal captains of Ibn Mardinich were two sons of the Count of Urgel and a grandson of Alvar Fañez, the favorite lieutenant of the Seed. In these alternations of religious indifference and fanaticism, the position of the Jews under Moslem domination was necessarily exposed to severe vicissitudes. Their skill as physicians and their unrivaled talent in administration rendered them a necessity to the conquerors, whose favor they had gained by the assistance rendered in the invasion, but ever and anon there would come a burst of intolerance which swept them into obscurity, if not into massacre. When Mahomet I ascended the throne of Cordova about 850, we are told that one of his first acts was the dismissal of all Jewish officials, including presumably Rabbi Hastai ben Isaac, who had been physician and vizier to his father, Abderrahman II. A century later, their wealth was so great that when the Jew Peliag went to the country palace of Alakem, the Caliph of Cordova, it is related that he was accompanied by a retinue of seven hundred retainers of his race, all richly clad and riding in carriages. How insecure was their prosperity was proved, in 1066, when Samuel ha Levi and his son Joseph had been viziers and virtual rulers of Granada for fifty years. The latter chanced to exile Abu Ishaq of Elvira, a noted theologian and poet, who took revenge in a bitter satire which had immense popular success. Quote, the Jews reign in Granada, they have divided between them the city and the provinces, and everywhere one of this accursed race is in supreme power. They collect the taxes, they dress magnificently and fare sumptuously, while the true believers are in rags and wretchedness. The chief of these asses is a fatted ram. Slay him and his kindred and allies, and seize their immense treasures. They have broken the compact between us, and are subject to punishment as perjurers." End quote. We shall see hereafter how ready was the Christian mob to respond to such appeals. The Moslem was no better. A rising took place in which Joseph was assassinated in the royal palace, where four thousand Jews were massacred and their property pillaged. Again they recuperated themselves, but they suffered with the Christians under the fierce fanaticism of the Almohades. Indeed, they were exposed to a fiercer outburst of wrath, for the robbery of the jewels of the Kaaba, which occurred about 1160, was attributed to Spanish Jews, and the Abd el Mumin was unsparing in enforcing his orders of conversion. Numbers were put to death, 
and forty-eight synagogues were burnt. The Sephardim, or Spanish Jews, lost their most conspicuous doctor when, in this persecution, Maimonides fled to Egypt. Still they continued to exist and to prosper, though exposed to destruction at any moment through the whims of the monarch or the passions of the people. Thus, in 1375, in Granada, two men obstructed a street in a violent altercation, and were vainly adjured to cease in the name of Mahomet, when Isaac Omoni, the royal physician, who chanced to pass in his carriage, repeated the order and was obeyed. That a Jew should possess more influence than the name of the prophet was unendurable. The people rose and a massacre ensued. While Saracen Spain was thus a confused medley of races and faiths, subject to no guiding principle, and swayed by the policy or the prejudices of the moment, the Christian kingdoms were much the same, except that, during the early Middle Ages, outbursts of fanaticism were lacking. Brave warriors learned to respect each other, and, as usual, it was the non-combatants, Christian priests and Moslem Fakis, who retained their virulence. In the fierce struggles of the reconquest, there is little trace of race or religious hatred. The early ballads show the Moors regarded as gallant antagonists, against whom there was no greater animosity than was aroused in the civil strife which filled the intervals of Moorish warfare. When, in 1149, Ramon Berenger IV of Barcelona, after a laborious siege, captured the long-coveted town of Lerida, the terms of surrender assumed the form of a peaceful agreement by which the Moorish alcaide of Vifalet became a vassal of Ramon Berenger, and they mutually pledged each other fidelity. A Vifalet gave up all his castles, retained certain rights in the territory, and Ramon Berenger promised him fiefs in Barcelona and Garona. More than this, the ceaseless civil wars on both sides of the boundary caused each to have constant recourse to those of hostile faith for aid or shelter, and the relations which grew up, although transitory and shifting, became so intricate that little difference between Christian and Moor could often be recognized by statesmen. Thus mutual toleration could not fail to establish itself, to the scandal of crusaders who came to help the one side, and of the hordes of fresh fanatics who poured over from Africa to assist the other. This constant intermingling of Spaniard and Moor meets us at every step in Spanish history. Perhaps it would be too much to say with Dozy that, quote, a Spanish knight of the Middle Ages fought neither for his country nor for his religion. He fought, like the seed, to get something to eat, whether under a Christian or a Mussulman prince, end quote. And, quote, the seed himself was rather a Mussulman than a Catholic, end quote though Philip II endeavored to have him canonized. But there can be no question that religious zeal had little to do with the reconquest. In the adventurous career of the seed, Christians and Moslems were seen mingled in both contending armies, and it is for the most part impossible to detect in the struggle any interest either of race or religion. This had long been customary. Towards the end of the ninth century, Bermudo, brother of Alfonso III, for seven years held Astorga with the aid of the Moors, to whom he fled for refuge when finally dislodged. About 940 we find a king Aboyahia, a vassal of Abderrahman of Cordova, transferring allegiance to Ramiro II, and then returning to his former lord, and some fifteen years later, when Sancho I was ejected by a conspiracy, he took refuge with Abderrahman, by whose aid he regained his kingdom, the usurper Ordoño in turn flying to Cordova, where he was hospitably received. About 990, Bermudo II gave his sister to wife to the Moorish king of Toledo, resulting in an unexpected miracle. In the terrible invasion of Almanzor in 997, which threatened destruction to the Christians, we are told that he was accompanied by numerous exiled Christian nobles. Alfonso IV of Castile, when overcome by his brother, Sancho II, sought asylum until the death of the latter in Toledo, a hospitality which he subsequently repaid by conquering the city and kingdom. His court was semi-oriental. During his exile he had become familiar with Arabic, 
in his prosperity he gathered around him saracen poets and sages and among his numerous successive wives was zaida daughter of el mutamid king of seville his contemporary sancho i of aragon was equally given to moslem culture and habitually signed his name with arabic characters the cooperation of christian and moor continued to the last in twelve seventy when alfonso x had rendered himself unpopular by releasing portugal from vassalage to leon his brother the infante felipe and a number of the more powerful ricosomes conspired against him their first thought was to obtain an alliance with abu jusuf king of morocco who gladly promised them assistance the prelates of castile fanned the name hoping in the confusion to gain enlarged privileges felipe and his confederates renounced allegiance to alfonso in accordance with the fuero and betook themselves to granada committing frightful devastations by the way everything promised a disastrous war with the moors of both sides of the straits when through the intervention of queen violante concessions were made to the rebellious nobles and peace was restored so when in twelve eighty two sancho the fourth revolted against his father and was supported by all the cities except seville and by all the ricosomes save the master of calatrava and was recognized by the kings of granada portugal aragon and navarre alfonso x in his destitution sent his crown to abu jusuf and asked for a loan on it as a pledge the chivalrous moslem at once sent him sixty thousand doblas and followed this by coming with a large force of horse and foot whereupon sancho entered into alliance with granada and a war ensued with christians and moors on both sides till the death of alfonso settled the question of the succession in thirteen twenty four don juan manuel was adelantado de la frontera conceiving some cause of quarrel with his cousin alfonso the eleventh he at once entered into an alliance with granada then at war with castile and in thirteen thirty three his turbulence rendered alfonso unable to prevent the capture of gibraltar or to recover it when he made the attempt pedro the cruel in thirteen sixty six and again in thirteen sixty eight had moorish troops to aid him in his struggles with henry of trastamara in the latter year the king of granada came to his aid with a force of eighty seven thousand men and in the final battle at montiel pedro had fifteen hundred moorish horsemen in his army one of the complaints formulated against henry the fourth in fourteen sixty four was that he was accompanied by a force of moors who committed outrages upon christians it was the same in aragon no knight of the cross earned a more brilliant reputation for exploits against the infidel than jaime i who acquired by them his title of el conquistador yet when in twelve sixty he gave his nobles permission to serve in a crusade under alfonso x he accepted the king of tunis and on alfonso's remonstrating with him he explained that this was because of the love which the king of tunis bore him and of the truce existing between them and of the number of his subjects who were in tunis with much property all of whom would be imperiled on the accession of jaime the second in twelve ninety one envoys came to him from the kings of granada and tremesen to renew the treaties had with alfonso the third to the latter jaime replied promising freedom of trade demanding the annual tribute of two thousand doblas which had been customary and asking for the next summer a hundred light horse paid for three months to aid him against his christian enemies as late as fourteen o five the treaty between martin of aragon and his son martin of sicily on the one hand and mahomet king of granada on the other not only guarantees free intercourse and safety to the subjects of each and open trade in all ports and towns of their respective dominions but each party agrees when called upon to assist the other except against allies aragon and sicily with four or five galleys well armed and manned and granada with four or five hundred cavalry all these alliances and treaties for freedom of trade and intercourse were in direct antagonism to the decrees of the church which in its councils ordered priests every sunday to denounce as excommunicate or even liable to be reduced to slavery all who should sell to moors iron weapons timber fittings for ships bread wine 
animals to eat, ride, or till the ground, or who should serve in their ships as pilots or in their armies in war upon Christians. It was in vain that Gregory XI, in 1372, ordered all fautors and receivers of Saracens to be prosecuted as heretics by the Inquisition, and equally vain was the deduction drawn by Americ from this, that any one who lent aid or counsel or favor to the Moors was a fautor of heresy, to be punished as such by the holy office. In spite of the thunders of the church, the traders continued trading, and the princes made offensive and defensive alliances with the infidel. Nor, with the illustrious example of the seed before them, had Christian nobles the slightest hesitation to aid the Moors by taking service with them. When, in 1279, Alonso Perez de Guzman, the founder of the great house of Medina Sidonia, was insulted in the court of Alfonso, he promptly renounced his allegiance, converted all his property into money, and raised a troop with which he entered the service of Abu Jusuf of Morocco. There he remained for eleven years, except a visit to Seville to marry Doña Maria Coronel, whom he carried back to Morocco. He was made captain of all the Christian troops in Abu Jusuf's employ, and aided largely in the war which transferred the sovereignty of that portion of Africa from the Almohades to the Beni Marin. He accumulated immense wealth, which by a stratagem he transferred to Spain, where it purchased the estates on which the greatness of the house was based. The family historiographer, writing in 1541, feels obliged to explain this readiness to serve the infidel, so abhorrent to the convictions of the sixteenth century. He tells us that at that period the Moors, both of Granada and Africa, were unwarlike and were accustomed to rely upon Christian troops, and that princes, nobles, and knights were constantly in their service. Henry, brother of Alfonso X, served the king of Tunis four years and amassed large wealth. Garci Martinez de Gallegos was already in the service of Abu Jusuf when Guzman went there. Gonzalo de Aguilar became a vassal of the king of Granada and fought for him. In 1352, when Pedro the Cruel began to reduce his turbulent nobles to order, Don Juan de la Cerda, a prince of the blood, went to Morocco for assistance and, failing to obtain it, remained there and won great renown by his knightly deeds till he was reconciled to Pedro and returned to Castile. Examples might be multiplied, but these will suffice to indicate how few scruples of religion existed among the Spaniards of the Middle Ages. As Barantes says, adventurous spirits in those days took service with the Moors, as in his time they sought their fortunes in the Indies. End of Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 2